Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and sign up for the free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter, newsletter where I share how to reduce risk and create, grow, and protect your wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Jack Schwager. Jack, are you ready to join the mission? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Let me introduce you. For those that, you know, that don't know you, I think a lot of my listeners are around the world and uh, they are in the finance industry, so they would know you, but I think um, others may not. Jack is a recognized industry expert on futures and hedge funds and the author of the iconic Market Wizard series in which he interviewed many of the trading legends of our time. In fact, about 70 people that he estimates he's interviewed in the various books, people like Ray Dalio as an example. Uh, I thought I would just run through the chronology of your books. I know when I was a young guy, I started as an analyst in 1993, and I uh, went to you know Market Wizards right away and started to try to you know understand. But let's go through the chronology. First, in 1984, The Complete Guide to the Futures Market. 1989, Market Wizards. 1992, The New Market Wizards. 1995, three volumes, Schwager on Futures Series. 1999, Getting Started in Technical Analysis. 2001, Stock Market Wizards. Hedge Fund Market Wizards was in 2012. In 2013, Market Sense and Nonsense. 2014, Little Book of Market Wizards, one which I would just listen to on Audible again uh, before this interview. And I highly recommend that one, particularly for those that say, I don't have a lot of time. That's a great one that sums it up all. And then you've got uh, an update to your uh, futures market book, and that is a complete guide to the future markets, futures markets, which you updated in 2017, and unknown market wizards in 2020. Jack, you've been busy. Tell us about the unique value that you're bringing to this wonderful world. Well, I guess it, just from feedback I've had, it's being a conduit to some of the great financial uh, minds and traders. And um, I've apparently done a good job in, in relaying their, their thoughts and their concepts and ideas and advice. And um, in fact, uh, once I got to the later Market Wizard books, I, I almost found that virtually everyone I was interviewing had read the original Market Wizard books. Uh, and in many cases, those books were there, were there, were the catalyst for them getting into the industry. So um, I guess on my that if I have a unique uh, contribution, it is being that conduit. And I'm curious, are you are you naturally a writer, or are you naturally a an interviewer, or how how do you how did you approach this? Yeah. I'd say the main skill in making the market was this book. I might, I consider myself a writer, probably foremost in in a way, uh, but I think edit. Editing is actually a super critical element, maybe maybe more important than the writing. Because my pure writing in, in the wizard books all counts for maybe 20% of the text, the, the intros and the summaries and the of chapters before and at the, at the end. Uh, but the heart of each chapter is the interview. And that those interviews get boiled down from, from really, in many cases, very long conversations, in some cases over two days period. So uh, I've had interviews where the, the tapes I was, or the discs I was listening to were as long as about 12, 13, 14 hours. And wow. that translates into a tremendous amount of, of, of uh, material. Plus when we speak, um, we are not literate. <laughs> in other words, it sounds fine in conversation, but if you literally copy you know, every word for word, we all sound illiterate with very rare exceptions. <laughs> and so you really have to do just to get it coherent and grammatical um, and to avoid, you know, to, to finish run on, you know, set incomplete sentences. 
and to truncate run-on sentences and, and to unify the same topic coming up 10 times in a conversation, there's really a tremendous amount of editing. So, you know, people uh, often say, you're a great interviewer, and I, I correct them. I say, I'm, a, I'm probably a great editor. I don't know about the interview part, because the interview is 2% of the work, the editing and the writing is 98%. Yeah, and I guess your your subjects really appreciate that, because they may be flowing in their expression of their ideas, but to have someone that really kind of structures that brings, you know, brings a lot more clarity to what they're saying. Yeah, if I do my job well, they they don't necessarily realize that. In other words, I'm trying to get as close to to what they're saying in their words, and and uh, so I, that's that's one of the objectives I have. You have another objective is making it you know read well and and be you know compelling and interesting. Uh, but if I do it right, they you know if you read a coherent version of what you said. They'll say, oh, yeah, that's what I said. You know, that's, but in reality, it isn't. You know, mm. so, <laughs> um, you know, there was an interesting, give me an interesting example. That this has nothing to do with coherence, but what one trader had a uh, was making a point, and he was he was talking about a psychological experiment, the famous psychological experiment that had done about how we misremember things, right? And it was a very it's a good example, but I kind of knew of the study and. I, th I think he had the right concept and was about right, but I thought certain elements weren't right. So I actually went back, got the study, and I edited his his interview to correct the mistakes that he had made because he was trying to quote it exactly. But so that's an example. But he, I'm sure he never knew that that they were corrected. That that, that was you know, that's an example. Anyway. That's a good one. And um, you know how I came up with this um, podcast, my worst investment ever was I was walking at the park here in Bangkok. And I was listening, I was just scanning through some podcasts to listen to while I was exercising. And there was this one that was called my worst interview ever. And I thought that's interesting. So I listened to that and I found a lot of like kind of famous guys in the spot podcast space talking about their worst interview. They had one guy that was explaining that the, that the guy he was interviewing was drunk and it was just like all over the place. And it was just his worst interview. And, and then I, I sent an email to the guy who had that podcast who may still have it. And I said, I love your idea. And I think I'm going to replace it with my worst investment ever. And just to say, appreciate what he's done. And hopefully that you don't have a problem with that. And I never heard from him, but it made me think for this interview, it would be fun to ask you, what was your worst interview ever? You don't have to call out names. Oh, yeah. if you don't want to. My worst interview ever. Well, <laughs> the worst interviews ever are anonymous because I didn't use them. Mm. So for every book there you know, what appears there are interviews that I did that never saw the light of day for a good reason. I, I couldn't make them remotely interesting um, or, you know, something that I would want to read. So those are, you know, so, but but that's kind of a, a general. Of the interviews that I did, um, there, were, I, there were two that, I, well, the one that I would think is, was, was the worst interview. And it was... Uh, there's a fellow called Gary Bielfeld, and I had this. How I found Bielfeld was the, was the following: um, I was a research director at the time, and and uh, responsible for putting out uh, or supervising uh, after the after the market closed summaries and stuff like that. And uh, when I was writing certain summaries, if I was if I was the one writing it, uh, or or follow, or something else about to say the bond market, I would often see. You know, Solomon was a was a big buyer today, and Morgan Stanley was a seller, and 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 BLH was a you know BLH was a prominent buyer, and I kept on seeing BLH, and I kept on, I said somebody in the business said, "What the hell is BLH?" Well, anyway, I did some research. I found out BLH was one guy in Peoria, and uh, so I said, "Well, that's a story." So uh, so and it turns out this guy sort of started out trading one or two lots of corn, which is one of the lowest con size contracts in futures. And he was successful and he built and built and built. And by the time I re I, I interviewed him, the guy was trading like 5,000 T-bonds, which is like, <laughs> those are big trades, you know? Mm. Uh, and so he was like really throwing around size in his trades that were, were as large as some of these big financial houses. So I went out to interview him and just the idea, I had to get that in because it was such a great story. And uh, turns out 
he's sort of a modern day Gary Cooper. Every ad, everything I asked him was like a one word answer or a yup or a no. You know, it was like, I couldn't get anything out of him. He was so, he was so succinct and not succinct in a, in an interesting way, just like, just in a way of somebody who just didn't want to talk much or whatever. Mm. And I, at the end, sort of bit on me, I kept on trying and trying different questions and nothing was working. And then at one point he, he said, I'm gonna, I have a, can you have a poker analogy that will be, you know, I said, oh, that's great. He says, except I don't want an under, could you turn off your you know, tape? So I turn it off, he gives me this poker analogy to trading and it was fine. And I, I said, why the hell don't you, what, what what's wrong with having that on the tape? And he said, well, um, he said, I don't want people to think it's like gambling or something. I said, no, it's not. I said, it's not gambling. You made the, you know, and I got, mm -hmm. so I got to use that paragraph, but I really had very, very little. It was the only interview where my narrative was longer than the interview. So uh, anyway, that was my yeah. first one. That's interesting. I mean, I've had some on mine, you know, I've now done more than 700 where I just see that the person needs some help. <laughs> and so I try to draw out a little bit more out of that and out of the story. But there are some definitely some people that just, you know, they just don't, they don't, you know, express a lot of it. What's also been funny is some people who like are like great storytellers, but then they come on and their storytelling isn't actually that great, which has been kind of surprising. Um, uh -huh. an another question I wanted to ask you before we get into the, the big question of the podcast, I mean, it's it's such an opportunity to get you on and you know i feel you know grateful that you're here uh i was going through the little book of market wizards and the lessons and uh you know i was thinking about it and, and then i was listening to uh your masters of business uh with barry uh, uh barry Hill. yeah and so that that was and I just thought, you know, if we could sum it up into, let's say, the three most important things for the average person out there when they're thinking about, should I be investing? Um, should I build a career in investing and all that? Uh, I kind of got to the point where it's like, okay, trading your own personality seems to be number one. Don't, you know, you may, you may try to find other, you know, you, you may try to find what's right for you by looking at others, but eventually trading your own personality was number one. Number two seemed to be the need for an edge, which is your chapter number four in the book that, you know, so what? You got your great personality style of trading, but if you don't have an edge, then it doesn't work. But then I was kind of, I wasn't sure where to go for number three. Like you have the importance of hard work. Uh, trading should be effortless. Um, you have risk management. I'm just curious, what would, are those, would yeah, those so, be the two and what would be the third or what, what yeah, would be the well, three? Number three, or number three might be number one, it would be risk management. And, um, uh, you know, most, particularly novices, but most people involved in trading and investing think it's all about finding a great methodology and putting on being brilliant and picking great trades and forecasting and all this, all this nice, colorful stuff. But really, when you get right down to it, all these traders, they'll tell you that the most important thing why they're still around and successful is risk management. And in cases where they've blown risk management, um, you know, it, they've not survived. So, uh, or in what's more common is in many of these traders, they didn't understand or appreciate or were effective with risk management in their early career and had sometimes, in some cases, multiple wipeout failures. So I would say, Risk management is, is definitely in the top three. It may be number one because to, to succeed, you have to stay in the game. And if mm. you don't have the risk management down, um, in, you, sooner or later, sooner or later, you're, you're going to wipe out. So um, I definitely would put that up there. And um, yeah, and I'm thinking like, you know, trading your own personality and getting an edge is kind of like a starting point. If you don't have those, risk management is kind of yeah it's it's yeah it's, you know you do no i'm saying yep. yeah so trading your own personality and having an edge are the components of yep. of having an approach that there's some reason why you should you know why you should come out ahead it's not just you're not just flipping coins or or you know i don't know uh, listening to people in the office and taking their ideas or whatever mm. yeah so uh that's so yeah so that 
yeah, and one of the points I make in talks is is that you 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 know risk management isn't enough. You 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 can have the best risk management if you don't have an edge, you're not going to win. Uh, example I use is you know roulette. I said you could ask you could ask a hundred mathematicians what's my best betting strategy in in roulette. You, you know you go you got ten thousand dollars you want to you want to bet for the weekend. They'll all tell you. I mean, assuming you can't, the advice can't be you don't bet. If you have to bet, they'll all tell you 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 bet it all one time, red or black, on or even, and then win or lose, walk away. Those are your best odds because you don't have an edge. Mm -hmm. And so, ironically, if you don't have the edge, your 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 best risk management is the exact 180 degree opposite of what we think of as risk management. Betting it all at once. I mean, you can't get further away from from reasonable risk management than betting everything on one trade. But if you don't have an edge, that is indeed your best strategy. Of course, a better strategy is not betting. But you know, <laughs> um, I like to call my podcast the number one risk management podcast. Even, even though I'm not an expert on risk management and my topic isn't risk management, but when you listen to these episodes, you you realize like there's a lot that uh, you know, there's a lot of lessons that that we can learn to to avoid big mistakes. But I'm just curious, like, what, how would you describe risk? I've, I've listened, I've read what you've said, and I've you know read everything I possibly can in the world of finance, and and I work in the world of finance still to this day, investing. But I'm just curious, like, what is risk? And by the way, my mother's listening, so she's 85 and she doesn't know anything about finance. So you got to keep it simple. Okay. Well, basically, well, risk is. You know, academics talk about volatility and you know and all that, but in essence, common sense and most people will tell you risk is losing money. So the idea of risk management is to mitigate or limit losses in two in two components. One, the maximum you could lose on any single trade um, or investment, and uh, the the other component is the maximum that you could lose in your whole portfolio. But those are the two elements. It has to do about controlling maximum loss. And if every trade you do, and I'm going to speak as a tr trading investing are not the same, and we can talk about that distinction as a separate question. Mm -hmm. But for now, let me just talk about one. So I'm not talking, uh, repeating everything twice for investing. Uh, let's assume that from a trading perspective, um, a key element is just making sure you don't risk very much on every each trade. And if you're risking a fraction of a percent or at maximum 1% in each trade, if you have some edge, none of them be a big one. But if you do that, the odds are good that you'll stay in the game um, because you're not, where people go wrong is they, they have some idea, they get, they think it's the best idea in the world. They put it on large, uh, they, 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 They'll think they'll get out if they start losing, but then they start they start rationalizing. Oh well, well this happened, but that's probably the bottom, and then the next thing's probably the bottom, and the next thing, and so on and so forth. So not unusual for people to kind of ride a single position into oblivion and wipe out their you know their account because they didn't limit the risk. But that's what it is. It's a matter mm. of controlling risk at the position size at the position sorry position le position level. And at the portfolio level. Great. That's a great description. And um, one last thing in relation to risk is that, you know, in the world of finance, we're kind of grasping at numbers to, to try to define what we're talking about. And we have things like maximum drawdown. We have things like standard deviation. We have things like Sontino ratio or all of these different measures. Are they measures of risk? Are they measured? And is a measure of volatility a measure of risk? It, volatility is sometimes a measure of risk. So it's it's a reasonable proxy sometimes, but at other times it's completely misleading. So um, when is it reasonable? Well, if uh, for example, if you uh, if you double your position size, you'll double the volatility and you'll double the risk. So in that example, it is. Um, and if you're if you're let's say if you're from an, now let's take, take an investing example. If you're investing in say uh, your your assets, the percentage you're investing in the stock market, uh, you know the larger percentage you invest, you know the the more your risk is, and and you know the larger the percentage, the bigger the volatility. So in those cases, it's correlated. Where it goes wrong is 
volatility measures both um, the very the you know volatility the the um, variation on the upside as well as the downside. So people only think of risk in terms of the downside. But if you have a strategy that has a lot of upside of vol you know movement, um, that could turn that could tell you that it's risky. Now I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, uh, one trader I interviewed who was one of the people actually that I found through Michael uh, Lewis's book, The Big Short, was one of the people who successfully made a fortune going short, you know, uh, in these bonds that were, uh, these subprime bonds that were just completely ridiculously mispriced. But that trade basically had, you know, you could only lose a limited amount in that trade uh, because there's, there's no reason for, for, the, for those bonds to go up. Mm. Uh, but, you know, you have to pay the interest, but, but that was it. Um, but if they were indeed bad, they, they could just go worthless. And so there was the opportunity. I think he made like 80 to one in that trade. Okay, and he was he, trading that it was going to go bad for the listeners. Yeah, he was, say, yeah, that. He these, these he was trading they're going to go bad. So that they're downside. Gonna go, they're going to go worthless, right. So, and he took positions that profited from those bonds going worthless. And uh, so I think he made something like some ridiculous amount, 80 to one, or some, some crazy ratio of the amount you risk to the amount. But in his record on that, let's say, and he, he that's the types of trades he looked for. So when he when he has a good month and when he wins, he's got an enormous up. It could look highly volatile, but he's limiting his he's limited his risk. Or it could be a trade where he's buying an option, so he can only lose a premium. So if he's right and there's a big move, he'll get he'll get a very large gain. But if he's wrong, he just loses the premium. So in his case, he has lots of volatility, but he doesn't have a lot of risk. Take somebody else who likes sells options, out of the money options, mm. that type of strategy will be a money machine as long as the markets don't go up or down too much. We don't think up and down moderately. It'll continually make money. But if you have a situation like uh, the, you know, March 2020 or uh, the 2007 or uh, 2007, 2008 situation, actually 2008, uh, the 2000 March peak, those types of situations, those strategies can get, you know, just get decimated without going into the details. So hmm. there you have, where if, if if you haven't hit one of those those events, it looks like a very smooth performance. You have low volatility, but high risk because the risk is sporadic. It's like walking through a minefield. If you don't step in a mine, it looks like there's no risk, but the mines are there. So so that's why I say volatility is a poor, is a poor uh, measure of risk because it's dead wrong in many instances, but, there are a lot of cases where it is a proxy and academics like it because the math works without getting it into details. Yeah. And that's, I guess what I was thinking now after you're talking is that um, it's, it's view volatility, standard deviation and those types of things, view them as a, an information metric that provides you information. And in some cases that information, um, high volatility may be, bad and in other cases high volatility may not be bad you know right and so uh that that's a good one um one of the things that that happened for me when i read your books is uh i i realized something i realized i'm not a trader i was a fundamental analyst i think you you've talked a little bit about your own background in other interviews i've heard but i i was a fundamental analyst and i was went to these books and I was very excited and I enjoyed reading the stories. But the more I read, the more I thought, I'm just not a trader like this. And I then had clients that were these men and women all around the world, the best traders, fund managers and traders. And I love to go and bring them my ideas. But it was I was never it, that that's what I got out of the book, as opposed to many people that said I really improved my trading style by using the tips and, and things that I saw from those guys. And and I'm just curious, uh, you know, I, you probably never thought that you helped someone in that way, but that definitely helped me kind of think, OK, go back to your fundamentals. This is what you like. This is what you do. Understand a little bit about momentum. But, you know, that that really helped me in the book. Yeah, well, that's that's an element, an example of uh, trade your personality, or in your case, invest in your personality. Yeah. 
Um, one last thing I wanted to ask before. I mean, I, I really been thinking a lot since uh, since since you signed up to come on the show, and I I don't want to take much more time on it, but I just thought, you know, one of the things we know in the world of finance, and we know in life. I I was a student of a guy named Dr. W. Edwards Deming. Uh, when I was a young man, he was the father of the quality movement. Came you know coming back from Japan and helping the Japanese, bringing his teachings into into America. And when I worked for Pepsi, they sent me to study with him. And um, the, the key thing that I learned from him, one of the key things was that there is variation underlying everything and that there's normal variation. So, and it helped me to realize that so many of the outcomes that I used to think were something, you know, unique. And you can look at companies, you know, they give a bonus to someone and they don't give a bonus to others based upon what is probably just random variation. And we also know that there is persistency in, let's say, coin flipping. There will be some people that flip heads over and over and some that flip ta tails over and over just by pure chance. How do we know that the people that you've interviewed are not just there because of chance, that they're there because of skill? Well, because of longevity. So I, I don't interview people who've, um, you know, got great records for three, four, five years. I, I try to find people, uh, you know, like minimum, minimum a decade. And in many cases, it's a couple of decades. And uh, um, so that's, you know, mm. uh, although I mean, there are exceptions, I think maybe, maybe earlier on the first market wizards book, I'm thinking somebody like Paul Tudor Jones, when I interviewed him, he only had like five years of trading behind him, or at least five years. He was managing money, and uh, five, admittedly, the five years he had like five three-digit years in a row. So there was, you know, I've kind of figured there was it wasn't pure luck, but um, and he, but he continued to be fine. You know? So um, essentially, though, I look for longer records. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at return risk as well, and I'm also looking for it. It, it could be like somebody who has very very good return risk or ex ex superb return risk. For a long period, or it could be somebody who's taking a small amount of money in, into a really uh, immense amount of money. That's the other type of story. But either way, those things usually don't happen by luck. I mean, okay, people that's get great. so longevity is a great. You want to keep trades. I mean, you can get somebody who uh, who buys tech stocks in 1997 and then is lucky enough to get out of 2000, you know, early 2000. It looks like a genius. That's I mean, I guess that's possible, but. It's it's not doesn't usually those people end up holding it and they give it all back. You know? And and um, some of the people are compounders where they're just trying to compound something, and some of them are taking money out to yeah. keep the size of their portfolios maybe at an optimal size because maybe their trading strategy doesn't scale. But who would you say is your the out of all the different people you've interviewed is the best compounder that ended up with the most at the end of the period that you've you know known them. Uh, yeah, so there's a there's a few, but the one I think that probably takes the prize is somebody in the most recent book, um, Unknown Market Wizards. And uh, so I got an email one day. Somebody says, "Well, you may not believe this, but uh, I turned you know a two thousand dollar account into fifty million. And uh, I I wasn't planning to do another book. I said, "Well, I'm not planning to do another book. That's a great story. If you can prove it, I'd certainly be interested." And so it turns out, like within a year, I did decide to do the, the non mark wizards. And I emailed them back and I said, Hey, I'm, I did, I am going to do a book. Can you, you know, prove it? And he sent me all statements. And so he, you know, said that was true. And it was two and a half thousand. I said 2000. Um, but, and in the last few years, I, you know, I've just did an update. I just did, did some interviews a few months ago for an update for the paperback with each of these traders. And he didn't want me to mention the amount of money, but he's essentially quintuple what he, you know, that. So, mm. I mean, for compounding. Which, which guy was that? Uh, Jeff Newman. Okay. Yeah. Jeff. So, Jeff Newman. So, in terms of compounding, I, I, I don't think anybody, you know, can, can get that on. Mm. I mean, there are people, certainly, I mean, people in the early books, like like Michael Marcus uh, started with a $30,000 account, and when I interviewed him, it built up to 80 million and that's pretty good, <laughs> but it's not two and a half thousand to 250 million. Yeah. So incredible. I think Jeff probably takes the, the cake. 
Mm. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to go through some of those things and, you know, giving us your insights and they're valuable to my audience who really is here to hear a story ultimately and your story. And so now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And as I always say, since nobody goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and tell us your story. So ironically, this my, the worst trade, at least the worst one I can remember, um, the one that sticks out in my mind and also one that has a lesson, uh, actually started out as, an, as a great trade uh, initially. So um, I remember in late 2008, the world was falling apart. And I thought to myself, I've seen this before. You know, this is like one of those panics you, I think it was a Rothschild who said, you know, you wait to buy until the, you know, the roar of the cannons are outside the city. And um, so I, I looked at certain things. I looked at like uh, the FXI, which is the Chinese ETF. And it was down like 75%. And, and the, uh, uh, the XLE, which are the, or the metals, the metals index, and it was down like around 70, 80%. And I thought, well, things like that. I was like, well, China is still, it's still an emerging market that's growing rapidly. Every reason why it'll still, you know, grow, it's not, you know, it's got to come back somewhat. I mean, if you buy it when it's down 75%, what, how much can you lose here? And um, the same thing with like metals. I said, metals, you need, you know, metals are needed for, for you know, they're just needed for everything, right? So they're, gonna, they're not going to go away in use. And so the market's going through a panic here and everything's getting sold. But these are things you can sort of bank on that sooner or later it'll come back. I don't know how long. So what I decided to do was to buy um, out of the money leaps, you know, calls as far out as I could, a couple of years, on the assumption that the longer the time, the more they were likely to come back. And I bought them out of the money. So they were pretty cheap. On so, the Chinese market. Yeah, well, the, the ETFs on the... Uh, the yep. ETFs on the Chinese market, ETFs on metals. Um, there were some others, you know. But so those are the big ones. The big one was the 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 FXI uh, and the and the the metal. So anyway, so several years later, I still had that position. You know, the calls had gone. I mean, they were out of money, but they were way in the money by the time you know by the time they were getting any close to expiration. I think I might even have uh, rolled them a year forward, you know, on the leaps. But anyway, so then I had that position. And I should have, I could have just taken profits, but at the same time, everything else had been rallying too. And in particular, the XRT, which is a retail index, and the uh, NASDAQ had, had had very, you know, large, had the largest rallies. And I thought they were probably a bit more of a duck. So I got, I got a little too smart by half. And instead of just taking what were really sizable profits in those positions, and th that was probably one of the best trades I ever did. Um, I, I instead said, well, I'll sell, I'll hedge myself by selling, um, by selling the XRT, which is the retail ETF and the NASDAQ, uh, you know, uh, ETF. And so I had that. So I was actually, I essentially put myself in a, in a spread position where I was short NASDAQ and re the retail index, and I was still long, you know, FXI. One day, and this is the, this I'll never forget. One day, the FXI goes down two percent, which is a fair size move for the FXI. Mm. But the the XRT goes up two percent, same day. So when I'm when I'm long goes down two percent, when I'm short goes up two percent. So I got a four percent loss on position in a single day. Now I knew and this is why it's such a bad trade. I knew. You never, you, I know you want to be the opposite. You want to be long the strongest and short the weakest. And here I was in exactly the opposite position. But that's why this is a mistake. I mean, I knew it. So the mistake is instead of just getting, you know, I should have covered. I mean, I knew I should have covered. But I said, well, this Forbes in one day is ridiculous for the spread. I'll get out, but, you know, it'll probably come back in a little bit. Well, it didn't. <laughs> it kept on widening and widening. And, and after a couple of weeks, I said, I, can't, I just got it. I got so I ended up giving back well not all my profits but but a much larger chunk than I should have and if I just had gotten out of the first day I would have I would have retained the you know the lion's portion of it uh, mm -hmm. as it was I gave back way too much so the mistake was staying in a position where I was like I said long the weakest and uh, short the strongest and and also just in a more general sense, 
staying in a position, you know, staying in a position where I knew it was bad, you know, trying to wait for a better spot. So, mm -hmm. so the mistake was not the the mistake wasn't so much that I instead of getting out of the FXI, I hedged it because okay, I thought I thought those were more overdone. I would maybe pick up some of the spread. But once I saw that two percent up, two percent down day, I should have been out immediately. And it ended up being a very sizable uh, retracement of profits. And mm. so that's my first trade. And and how did you how do you know if it is just a just noise, you know, it's just um, movement in the markets that can be, you know, painful sometimes, but you should hold your position versus knowing that, okay, I, I've got to close this position. And I think part of that may go back to what you talked about, about risk management and trying to think also about overall portfolio losses and stuff. But I'm just curious, because there are plenty of times when you're in something and you're like, I believe in this, but it's not working in my favor. Uh, and then you immediately cut out and then you didn't give it enough time to work. I'm just curious, how do you think about that? Yeah, well, well, that's going to happen no matter what you do. It happens to everybody. Um, but in this case, it was much more clear cut. Now, you don't, you never know anything, right? Mm. <laughs> what, whatever, whatever your approach is, whatever your approach is, you, there are certain things that contradict that approach. So the mistake here, so I, one of the things I knew was you, when you have related markets, you want to be long what's, what's the strongest and short what's the weakest. Mm. And, you know, if you're in, if you have a spread position on, or if you're going short, you want to look for the, the weakest, the weaker market in a sector, and you want to be long the st stronger markets in a sector. So I knew that. So here I had a clear violation of something that I believe now. That, that rule doesn't work all the time. Nothing works all the time, but it works more often than it doesn't. And I knew that. And the fact that I that I ignored that, that's where the mistake was. And um, now to kind of step back and, and, and simplify that, how would you describe the lessons that you learned? Yeah, so, well, well I get the broad, the broad lesson, which is, is don't violate anything that you believe in, you know? never stay in a position that violates something that you believe in. I mean, all the trades that I would consider mistakes come down to doing something that I knew enough that it was wrong. And so that's what makes a mistake. It's not that it loses money. This is where people go wrong. A mistake is not a trade that loses money. A mistake is a trade where you did something that violated whatever your approach is that makes money over time. And, and and that could be a lot of different rules, but it could be any of those rules that are violated. So, so the big lesson is never stay in a trade that violates something that you know that that you believe in, or that you would really be on the other side of normally if you weren't already in the position. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the big that's the big rule. Yep. I mean that's and the most important lesson. And one of the things that um, if, if I would add something to this, the one thing I would say is that sometimes you're just entering at the wrong time and that your thesis may work. It just may be right now there's other factors overwhelming that thesis. So there's nothing wrong with exiting. And then you can still watch that thesis if the thesis ignites at some point. It's just that you had a good idea, but it was just a wrong time. Sometimes we just have a bad idea. So yeah. that would be kind of the other thing I would just add to it. What, what anything else you would add to that? No, I mean that's that's correct. I mean sometimes there are a lot of trades that are, trade ideas or investment ideas that may be good, but you know, the timing is wrong. And the loss in the interim may be more than you can help manage until it finally does work out. So the safest thing is to always decide this is the maximum amount I'm going to risk on this idea. And that prevent, if you stick with that, that prevents you from losing too much on any idea, because invariably there'll be something, you know, and it may not be a free, it may not be anything you did wrong. It could be something that, uh, like, look, um, sort of, uh, oh, uh, the well, COVID situation. Well, there were some signs earlier on, but so I guess maybe that's not the perfect example. But if it came, I mean, there were some signs a week or two before. But let's say something like that occurs without any indication at all. And the market suddenly goes down a lot. Well, that's nothing you could have anticipated. That's, that would be, 
example. But it, it, depending what you're in, it could be uh, it could be any any event that could be that's unforeseen, unforeseen, right. or there is no way anybody could could anticipate it, and it works against your position. So that's a situation where you um, you lose money, but it's not because you were wrong in your analysis. It's just that a completely unforeseen event happened. Mm. Um, you know, but it's, you, you could be, let's say you're, um, you're, you're, you're uh, short, you're short some agricultural commodity and there's a sudden event that's completely anticipated that uh, maybe, you know, maybe there's a disease of the crop that suddenly gets announced or anything, or there's a weather event that occurs suddenly uh, that, that destroys the a large portion of the crop. You, you couldn't anticipate that necessarily. So, you know, that's. Mm. Yeah. And I, I had a, a recent trade where I went into U.S. banks and I went in basically riding some momentum. So my thesis at the time was that the momentum was strong enough in the large banks at the time that I saw a small position that I could put into that, into my portfolio. And it was about 7% of the overall portfolio. And then Silicon Valley Bank happened, boom. Yep. And now, yeah. now all of a sudden you're in a situation where you're either going to sit there and say, well, my thesis is still right and blah, 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 or you're going to get out. And basically I, I ended up exiting that position within a few days of opening that position, just because I knew I wasn't coming in to play a turnaround in banks or something like that. And therefore I was getting out. That's a perfect example. You yeah. know, so there's no way you can anticipate that really. So. And, you know, the other thing I think this ties back to the top three things that we talked about at the beginning about, you know, you had your own um, trading, you know, style that fits your personality. And th the other point is that you have some edge, you, you know what your edge is, you know, you've got to have an edge and be aware of it. And I think in the risk management process, it sounds like, you know, have knowing when you're going to exit before you enter is such a valuable risk management tool that helps you to predetermine future action so that when the emotions run high or you come up with a new thesis, you're able to override that and say, nope, I'm going to. And so I, I would add in that as kind of a risk management tool is predetermined yeah. the future action. That's that, that is what I, what I kind of label the most important single, most important piece of advice you could give anybody is know where you're going to get out before you get in. And you said it long before I ever said it. So you are the man. Well, actually, I was quoting Bruce Conner. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now let's just think. Uh, now let's go to a young person right now who are, young people are seduced by all kinds of investing opportunities, whether that's Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies or tech stocks or whatever. There's all kinds of opportunities that they're facing. Um, I want you to think about, you know, what you learned from this story and what you've continued to learn. Let's now imagine a young person, you know, that who's investing, like what's, what's one action that you would recommend that they take to avoid suffering the same fate, the same loss? Uh, assuming they're already involved in trading or investing. Let's say that they're well, relatively new to it, but they are trading. But they're, they're already trading. I'm just yep. thinking we're talking at what level of novice we're talking here. Uh, I would say the single most important thing is what you just said before is, you know, on every position, decide, know where you're going to get out before you get in. Mm. And what's a resource that you'd recommend for our listeners, yours of yours or any others? Um, yeah. In terms of, uh, you mean like books or whatever? So yeah, uh, it, it, I mean, I, I would say my, my first answer to that is the, the little book is the, you know, the one that really kind of encapsulates a lot. So out of all of your books, maybe what's the one that you would say that people could start at? That's an yeah, idea. So, Any other books or yeah. things that have helped you? Yeah, I wrote that exactly for that. It's just for, for more, you know, for people who just didn't want to, you know, just wanted a more, I guess it's the most layman of the books, of, of the books. It's, and it's not, although it's a Mark Wizard book, it isn't a Mark Wizard book because it's not the interview style type of thing. Uh, but yeah, so that book I tried to boil down, I think it was 20 key principles I learned from the book. So th mm. that's for uh, a novice and a lay reader, that's probably the, that's probably a good starting point. And, 
if that resonates, they can go to the actual, you know, the, the original, the other interview books, which are more detailed and, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you know, so, and as far as other books, I always recommend Reminiscences of a Stock Operator um, by, you know, uh, La Fever, mm -hmm. which is a book that was written in the 20s, but still resonates. Um, and uh, actually, I've been trying to remember all the books I recommend. If uh, if people go on Quora and uh, and query my name along with recommended books, there was a point in time where I did a day session there and answered a bunch of questions. And I think and I got that list right about, here. The yeah, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. And I'll put this in the show notes, ladies and gentlemen, but The Diary of a Professional Commodity Trader by Peter Brandt. Yeah. Fooled by Randomness uh, by Taleb and uh, a bunch of other ones. So I'll, I'll definitely yeah. include those uh, yeah. in the show yeah, notes. Those are, yeah, those are my recommendations on books. And and who is the person that you really, really want to interview? That I haven't? Yes. Well, uh, the, the person I most wanted to interview that I never was able to get, I actually never was able to get to him, you know, directly. Uh, but through his intermediaries, I was not successful with George Soros. And do you think there's any any hope now or it's still... No, I gave up. I tried a couple of times. And yeah. yeah. Um, and last question, what, what is your own, you know, in your own life, in your own personal or work life, what's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Oh, I don't have a goal. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So, uh, yeah. Goals, by the way, aren't always good. Um, especially when it comes to trading or investing, because and this is this is a point of made in my books and particularly the most recent book. Um, and uh, one 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 of the traders in there makes it Hamid Sal, who who you know a phenomenal trader, but he worked in in trading uh, among other traders, so in these prop trading shops, and I uh, saw a lot of traders. I asked him with differentiating differentiation between between successful and unsuccessful traders. He said one, one uniform thing he saw in, in a lot of unsuccessful successful traders is they had a target to what to make every month. And it's ironic because that people would say, gee, that sounds like a good thing to do. Well, the reason it's a bad thing is because the market doesn't give a damn about what your target is. <laughs> I mean, whatever your approach is, there are times the market's going to be conducive to it. There's times where there's just not going to be opportunities. And if you're trying to make a, a profit goal every month, and it's not a month where it is, uh, you know, right for your strategy, whatever it is, then you're going to be taking suboptimal positions and trades. Mm -hmm. And those are the types of things that can end up being losing money. So the very, it's ironic, the very existence of a target in, will cause you to lose money uh, in many instances. And the instances where the market is not favorable to your approach, whatever it is, are fairly common. Mm. That it's an interesting parallel I thought about in um, my understanding of the teachings of Dr. Deming is that the idea I came up with was that if if the subject you're measuring knows it's being measured, then a target is dangerous. Now, in the case of the stock market, it doesn't know that it's being measured, but I think yeah, you're, 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 you've just got so much factors and randomness in there that putting a target related to that ultimately is just, you know, kind of seems like it's a, it's a fool's errand. So, yep, it's a good point. Um, well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. As we conclude, Jack, I want to thank you again for coming on the show and joining the mission. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status. For turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment, do you have any parting words for the audience? No, I appreciate the, uh, you know, you did a good job on the questions and I enjoyed it. Thanks. Well, we, we all enjoyed it very much. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today we added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott saying, I'll see you on the upside.